and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on podcastufo.com. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And our guest for this evening is Butch Witkowski. And we're going to be talking about UFOs in Pennsylvania and uh, in hour two, we're actually going to be talking about a very interesting subject, uh, human mutilations. So that's going to go a little bit off topic, sort of. We don't know if it's off topic or not. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about Butch um, right before we introduce him. And I want to thank all the listeners that support the show. And if you can't support the show and still want to listen free, you can always listen on podcastufo.com every Wednesday night at 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or on the Dark Matter Digital Network. That's Thursdays at 10 to midnight. I want to tell everybody that I am completely bald, and if you don't believe me, just go to podcastufo.com. You'll see right there a picture of myself shaved. And you know what? It's cold, even though it's warm. I have a a kind of a cold head. And you know, I I might keep the look. I think it I think it actually looks pretty good, but I'm proud to say that because of all my friends and all the people that listen to the show and uh, some family members, we have exceeded the goal of $1,000, and it's still growing. People can still donate. They keep it open for a while. We had one listener in particular that really stepped up to the plate, and I'm going to mention his name, uh, Alan Sanderson. Thanks so much. And a number of listeners, there's another one, uh, Reginald, I hope I can say, Reggie, he uh, pitched in really as well. And it doesn't matter, small donations, big donations, it's all been very uh, nicely received. They're very excited over there at the, uh, it's called uh, One Mission Buzzoff, uh, com, dot org. <clears throat> They're extremely excited because I exceeded my goal and everyone's real happy. I'm real happy and I want to thank everyone that helped out in that. And let's see, Alejandro, how are you doing? I am good. How are you? Doing great. And you know, it's yeah. good to, you, your Skype sounds perfect tonight. The last couple good. of weeks we had trouble and mm-hmm. somehow it's mm-hmm. worked itself out. Glad to have you back. Yeah, it was changes with the wireless internet here at my work and we finally got that worked out and uh, it's a good thing. It's good to be talking to you on Skype again. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do we have anything happening? I know that it's been kind of quiet, which is good in some ways, an, but bad in another way. I like when things are active. Yeah, anything? We don't, we don't have anything. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good. I'm just kidding. Good we always got to. something. Yeah. So uh, I guess the first thing I'd like to talk to you about, I don't think we talked about this on your show, and uh, my memory is too... Uh, terrible to to remember. Uh, did we talk about that ham radio case? It's not. Boy, I'll I tell you what. If I'm forgetting it and uh, the listener remembers it, I'll be in big trouble. But I don't remember anything. <laughs> yeah. So this is a neat case where uh, Pat Daniels is his name. He, I guess, has his own podcast on paranormal topics and such. But he listens. He's a ham radio enthusiast. And he was listening to his ham radio uh, one evening, and he heard he was listening to transmissions between um, airliners and a control tower, and he heard uh, this plane report a UFO sighting, um, which is kind of exciting. Here's a quote from uh, the website UFOs Northwest, which helped with the investigation, about what he says he heard. He says, a pilot reported seeing an extremely large bright object that he estimated a mile wide to his right. The air traffic controller told him that he was looking in the direction of Nephi, Utah. Apparently, the air traffic controller told the pilot that the object was not detected on radar. The object appeared to keep pace with the aircraft. 
So he was excited. That's what he's listening for. But unfortunately, he didn't record it. He did go to Utah MUFON. Erica Lukes was the um, the director at the time. And uh, they did an investigation. They went and listened to the archives of these these aircraft. And they did find some archives for and figure out what flight it was. They found out it was an American Airlines flight from uh, San Francisco to, I think it was something like Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, then they put in a FOIA request. They also enlisted the help of William Puckett of UFOs Northwest. William Puckett has a, uh, was a meteorologist for a while, worked for the EPA for uh, many years, uh, and he's worked in our radar and so he's helped out with many radar UFO cases. So uh, they put in a FOIA to the FAA to get more information, and they got they hit the mother load. Six weeks later, they got audio tapes, tower logs, and uh, some radar data. So uh, the audio did confirm that there was a report. So in the audio, which is posted on our site and on UFOs Northwest, you can hear the conversation. And the pilot does say that uh, he asked, you wouldn't happen to know what this uh, bright orange square we're flying over is, would you? Uh, The tower said, no, I'm not sure. Is it on your right side? And the pilot says, it's actually directly off our nose right now. It's below us. Um, What town are we next to? And they said, you're near Nephi, Utah. And the pilot said, okay, cool. Now I'll see what I can go find. Thank you. Uh, so that's the extent of the conversation. So unfortunately, uh, you, the pilot doesn't mention this object, you know, following them or being a mile wide or even being in the air. So it gives the impression mm-hmm. it could possibly be something on the ground. However, the researchers are pretty sure uh, that the, this audio was edited. So parts of it huh. were removed. So they, they don't feel they have the full audio. Um, and then they did, William Puckett did some uh, look at the radar data, and he did find off to the right of the object just south of Nephi, um, actually just above the highway there, Highway 15, he found some uh, unknown uh, returns. So it was a, he, he also talks about how these returns were very erratic, so kind of strange, like the, the object perhaps was tumbling or moving strangely. Um, hmm. So... A uh, great case, a great research to try to confirm that something did happen. Uh, Mark D'Antonio uh, of MUFON took a look at the case, and he argues that, you know, unfortunately, the official story, all we have is someone talking about something below the plane. So there's a couple possibilities. It could be a fire, a controlled fire on the ground, which would uh, explain what they saw, and the radar returns. The smoke would be the radar returns. Oh, really? However, uh, investigators have retorted and said, well, uh, that's not the case because we didn't see the that on Doppler, and this isn't an area where they can do controlled burns. Um, another researcher suggested it was a perhaps a nearby power plant. But Luke's and Puckett say, uh, well, I think these pilots, having flown in this area uh, many times, would have known of the nuclear power plant, so wouldn't have mistaken that for something strange. Uh, and they're still trying to get more audio and um, a witness, perhaps maybe even a pilot, so they can confirm that the pilot did say you know, it was a mile wide and this was something in the air because that's a big key. And right now all we have is Daniel's word to go on on uh, those aspects. Wow. Now, and why would he he even bother to pursue it if it wasn't something like that, really? Um, And this orange thing on the ground may not have anything at all to do with what he had said possibly earlier about the mile wide thing. It's possible, although it was an orange, a bright orange square, he was uh, explaining as something that was a mile wide, according to Daniels, in what he had heard. In fact, that's the only key between what uh, Daniels reportedly heard and what is in the audio, which uh, appears to confirm Daniels, uh, uh, what he had heard on the transmission. So that confirms that he heard something. you know, can we be certain that Daniels isn't mistaken somehow in uh, his memory? Uh, we can't say for sure. And, uh, you know, Daniels, I've heard from multiple sources, is a trustworthy person. 
However, uh, you know, in order for this case to really have some bones, to really have uh, more to it, we'll need some more official um, verification that uh, these pilots did feel that they were observing something peculiar that was in the air. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a pretty good one. I- yeah, it's a cool case. I really like it. it I really like the work that was done to confirm, and uh, and it's surprising that the FAA got back so quickly with the FOIA request. Now, would you think that it's possible this pilot would uh, report this to NICAP? Um, possible, but, you know, it's just a minority of sightings that are reported. Um, if it was reported, I think that um, Richard Haynes and the other the guys that um, – and from what I understand, one of the people who work with uh, NARCAP, Ted Rowe, I think is helping out or they've actually consulted with him on this case. So, um, And they haven't reported having uh, received any reports on this. So hmm. uh, it sounds like the pilot just kind of was asking, you know, do you know what this is? They said no. Uh, but there's an interesting, you know, thing is that uh, the – Rate the tower said, "Is this thing off to your right?" And uh, some people ask, "Why did the the tower say that?" It almost uh. implies that the tower was um, referring to some radar uh, hits or something that they saw on radar. Because, you know, how did he know hmm. that uh, whatever this was was to the right? That's a real good point, and um, I'd never heard of smoke causing any radar hits before, but I guess it makes sense if it's dense enough. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, smoke can definitely do that. I guess uh, their argument, though, is that smoke would also repair on Doppler, and they did check their Doppler radar, and and they didn't see that. But um, uh, there's no argument that smoke could cause radar um, um, hits So uh, among the, the experts, so... So I guess that's uh, still a possibility, but Mark is is just saying that this is just a possibility he's exploring, um, but they'll definitely need uh, on that end to prove if that was the case, they'll they'll need more evidence to that also. So, um, for instance, some recording of a controlled burn in the area or something like that. You know, another thing is a lot of the UFO sightings that you hear about um, have uh, create no hits on radar at all. And uh, that happens quite often, actually, which is another mystery within itself. You know, maybe, uh, of course, if they can can get here from wherever they're getting here from, they can probably be as stealth as they want to be. Mm-hmm. Probably. uh, Yeah. So what else is happening? So what else? This is a story uh, that uh, Roger Marsh just sent in and posted uh, today of uh, an event that took place in 2014, September 12, 2014. Now, it's an old case. We wrote about it on September 15th of 2014 at TV. Um, but it is brought up again, and, and they finally kind of uh, have at least closed it. It's not completely closed, but uh, they've just decided to, to mark it as an unknown. This is a uh, a sighting that actually the, – the story is UFO over Las Vegas described as moving into a mist. And this witness recorded uh, this video of this bright object that has like a mist below it. Some people described it as a, a beam of light that was headed towards the ground. Um, however, many experts feel that this video, which is pretty interesting, uh, is, is most likely a rocket. Uh, and if you you know we know more lately since we had those those really big sightings in California fairly recently with uh, the rockets making these extraordinary you know huge brightly lit um, orbs in the sky uh, and this looks somewhat similar to that and it was seen across several states when it happened and it mm. made a lot of news. However, what's interesting, and this is noted in the MUFON investigation very well by the researcher, um, is that the investigator on this case, is that there was never any conclusion. So there were lots of Hmm. ideas about what it might have been, and the news pursued uh, these, and such as Vandenberg, a rocket from Vandenberg, uh, 
a rocket from a, a test rocket from a submarine off the coast uh, of California. Uh, all of these different ideas, however, they couldn't find those to be the case. They talked to Vandenberg, they talked to the uh, Navy, and uh, they said, nope, not ours, not ours. So they, it was never found what it might be. In fact, when I looked at our story, uh, James Oberg, who's a space journalist and a historian, he writes a lot for NBC and, and uh, I think mostly for NBC, but also others, space.com and stuff like that. He uh, actually often looks at our stories, and he said that it looked like a pretty standard rocket launch. Um, however, the usual suspects seem to have alibis this time, he said. <laughs> so uh, it, we still don't know you know, who it was, where this rocket came from. So it's still a mystery. That is really strange. You would think that it would you know, come right up who it was. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, it's off the coast of California, for God's sakes. I mean, no one can, like, launch a rocket without uh, having any, oh, I don't want to say, um, you know, record of it. But no one can just plain launch a rocket without anyone yeah. knowing about it, yeah. unless, unless it's the enemy. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling that, you know, if you and I, you know, went to San Diego, let's say, and rented a boat and, uh, you know, launched a rocket off like a mile off the coast or something, uh, it would get noticed and uh, they'd figure out it was us and we'd probably get in a little bit of trouble. But, I know, uh, but, you know, this is a type of trouble I would like to get in. So when yeah, are we doing it? Would you? Yeah, because now I have See, a shaved head and I'm criminal-like. Exactly. Right? You're one of yeah. those kind of you're, – you're a bad dude now. You're like – That's right. S- but, uh, yeah, so this is really weird. I mean it could have been a top-secret test. Um, you know, and so it's kind of their, their uh, an unacknowledged test, but a test where the populace could see it. It's it's a big mystery. I think it's so strange. It's really weird. Now, did um, you may have said this, and I may have just missed it. Were, are there is there film clips of this? Oh, there's there are videos and pictures of this, and in, in particular, uh, Rogers writing about one video. Uh, that MUFON received, and they posted it on YouTube, and it's in our story. But I also put a link to uh, our story on it from 2014, and uh, Jason McClellan had written that story, and he has some video and other links to some other videos that were um, captured of this uh, object in, in September 2014. Excellent. Well, hey... Thanks so much, man. It's always fun to have you on the show. Hey, it's my pleasure, buddy. Uh, congratulations on, you know. On having no hair? Match, yeah. Well, matching your goal. You That's probably right. Thank you. And actually, you probably raised about a dollar per strand of hair because you really didn't have that many. <laughs> uh, you know what? When I, saw, when I saw what was left, all the gray hair on the floor, it really made me, I felt young again. Really? Yeah, I feel younger now. Well, that's good. Viral. You know? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you sound like it when you say yeah. that. Yeah, I got a little pep in my step. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Just don't go commit any crimes or I'll go try not to. buy a Harley or something. Yeah, well, the Harley's, uh, yeah, it's on layaway, but yeah, I don't know. I'll think about that. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> thanks so much. And, All uh, right, no problem. We'll be talking to you next week. Talk to you soon, buddy. All right, everyone. So a little bit about our guest. Um, Butch has been an independent researcher since 1989 when he, along with four other people, witnessed a UFO of unbelievable size quietly um, hovering above a mountain in Tucson, Arizona, and it was totally silent. And that's one of the things that, you know, baffled me the most about my own sighting is that it was silent. It was uh, burnt copper in color and at least three football fields in length. Well, Butch began his own investigation into the UFO phenomena on that very day. He joined uh, MUFON in 2007, and he was able to dig deeper into the past and existing cases and pursue even more on-site investigations. But his research was still lacking something, and he wasn't getting to the crucial answers that he was seeking. It was this time... Uh, to go about his work in a different manner. And after almost a year of serious reflection and consideration, 
Butch started UFO Research Center of Pennsylvania in 2009. And he brought together some of the best like-minded and long-time researchers he could find. We'll talk more about that. And so hang on just a minute. We'll be right back with our guest, Butch Witkowski. Welcome to the show, Butch. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And uh, this is another thing uh, sometimes that, you know, probably shouldn't bring it up at all, but we almost didn't get this thing together. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's the thing about live shows. You know, anything can happen. And uh, my Skype wasn't talking to your Skype and phone issues weren't working uh, on and on and on, but we did it. We're here. Yep, got that solved. That's right. (laughs) So, Butch, um, I um, always look around for, you know, different uh, people in the UFO field. And your background uh, was fascinating. I watched uh, you <clears throat> lecture on YouTube and thought you'd be interesting to have on the show. And I always like, like to say um, it doesn't have to be someone totally mainstream. It's always fun to have um, different views. And, and it's, a, you know, it's one of the reasons I love doing the show. So let's, um, why don't you tell the listener your background? I just told the story how you got interested in UFOs, but let's hear your, your background. You, you were uh, involved in criminal investigation or something like that in the past? Law enforcement. And then uh, after the sighting, uh, I took an interest in trying to find out what I actually witnessed there in Tucson with others. I should mention that every sighting I've ever had, I've never been alone, so I know I'm not crazy. <laughs> and... Um, uh, like you said, I just I, I was just needing to go about it a different way. I wasn't getting the answers I wanted. And after spending a small fortune on a library and uh, all this other stuff that you need to do on the Internet and, you know, talking to people and going to conferences and this and the other thing, I decided to start the UFO Research Center. And um, we started in 2009 uh, with one group. We now have 12 groups, two in Europe and 10 in this country. Um, mm. Florida, Georgia, Utah, um, Oklahoma, to name a few, all the researchers involved are all long-time researchers, either, you know, on their own or with MUFON. They encompass uh, current and former police officers. Uh, we have a federal judge. We have uh, photographic uh, analysts. We have psychiatrists. We have private detectives. Uh, we have... Um, uh, abduction research specialists, uh, and we do it a little differently uh, than most groups because what we try to do is prove that something happened or didn't happen forensically. Because if it didn't, couldn't happen forensically, then it didn't happen. So if somebody mm-hmm. tells me that they saw something above the trees at about a thousand feet, and then I look at the weather and I find out that there was no visibility whatsoever, or it was a blowing snowstorm, you pretty much know it was, you know, made up story. Mm-hmm. But when you go out and you uh, spend a day or two or three uh, on a case uh, on site, and we have two mobile units here in the state, uh, they're fully equipped. Uh, Matter of fact, we just replaced the one. We got a brand spanking new one. Uh, And they have everything in them from, you know, built in laptops and uh, internet connections, radar, um, uh, every type of investigative tool that you can need on the scene of anything. I don't care if it's a paranormal event or a UFO event or a cryptozoology event. We have all the equipment on there. The only difference between the truck and the East Coast, on the east end of Pennsylvania, sorry, which is parked out in front of my place, to the one that's out in the west end of Pennsylvania, is that we have repelling gear in this truck, and that other truck has um, dive gear because he's a certified diver. Other than that, the trucks are equipped the same. Uh, we have our own personal radio channel. Uh, channel well, we have actually have six, and um, they're regular. Everything's either military grade or police grade in, in the units, um, and it really works out very well because I can go. Well, we just took a fast trip down to Virginia uh, to investigate some body parts that were found. 
And uh, we had everything to do what we had to do, including take DNA and everything else. So, I mean, there's very few groups, and I would say probably maybe, I don't think there's any out there to do that. Um, everybody kind of does the old um, talk to the person that made the report. Uh, some look at the area, some never go to the area. Um, cameras, we have uh, infrared, we have uh, television grade video. Uh, all our cameras are Nikon, all our, our computers are Panasonic tough books. So we have canopies, we have tents we can set up, we have tables, chairs. I mean, we've got everything we need. Uh, we can go out, we can actually spend seven days in the field without leaving the truck. Wow. Now, where does it, where does the money come from to to get these babies on the road? Uh, my this, pocket, really, it's privately funded. Yes, uh, we don't take um, donations. Um, we don't um, we don't solicit any donations, and I did that for a reason. Um, you know, once you start asking for donations or people, you have a donor that's really giving you some serious money. You're kind of beholden to somebody. And I don't ever want that to be said about us, that, you know, well, the only reason we're agreeing with him is because he gave him a check for $1,000 or something like that. I don't ever want to hear that. Sounds like campaign contributions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we uh, do it on our own. Uh, now, we do take uh, old equipment that people don't use anymore because we do have a couple folks in our group that they just can't afford to go out and buy equipment. So if somebody wants to donate mm -hmm. an old camera or an old – a uh, tape player or something, a video uh, camera or something like that. We'll take that and send it to them. Uh, but that's the, only, that's the only type of donations we ever take. And I think we took two cameras and one video camera, and I think somebody sent us a bunch of star maps one time. So that's pretty much all we've ever taken, and I'm really not uh, really not into that. I mean, there's always, there's always bad vibes with that, I, I, and I just don't want to get involved in that drama. Yeah. Okay. Now, if anyone wants to call in, I do believe our phone is working. You can call in and ask the guest a question. If you're listening live, you can jump, <clears throat> excuse me, jump in the chat room as well and ask a question. The phone number is 603-967-4030. Uh, where do you get your, uh, your calls on how does someone get a hold of you that has witnessed something? Uh, we have a, um, a website um, www.u4cop.com and there's a contact thing at the bottom of the page where they can send in their report or if they just want information uh, we'll do we'll we'll analyze photographs for people we'll uh, uh, research our databases for something maybe somebody's looking for from the past or, or present um, mm -hmm. tell people where they can get stuff I mean you know uh, we operate a little differently we're pretty much open to everybody Will help anybody. Um, uh, we've traveled pretty much all over the eastern half of the country, and um, we do conferences. We don't charge for that. We uh, do a lot of speaking engagements. Uh, we don't charge for that. So um, it, it works out very well. I mean, I think that the groups years past got away from dealing with the public, um, mm. except for uh, yes, you know. You know what I'm saying? They, mm -hmm. they more or less deal with uh, the next book they're going to write or the next white paper they're going to print. And they kind of left that getting really involved with the case. That kind of went by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let's hear a situation where you mm -hmm. have used some of this equipment in your, your trucks and, and, and trying to solve the situation. Well, uh, a lot of times they are, um, you know, let's, let's say we're going out and we're going to do a star watch. You know, we'll set up canopies, tables, get our computers out, and set up all the cameras, get the infrared out, get the uh, get everything out we need. And uh, that's pretty much done at almost everything we go to, not so much that we'll set up cameras, but if we think that, you know, an individual is seeing something um, – you know, weekly or monthly or a certain time of the day or or during a certain type of weather. We've gone out in snowstorms already hmm. where a guy said he kept seeing flashing lights off in the distance. So we went out and we sat in a truck and we watched and, and we got our photographs and went in there and told me he was watching a, a tower flashing red. <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing, I, <laughs> I live on top of a mountain and over, another mountain over there is a tower 
that's flashing. And when it's like snow or, or something like that, the light really does carry. So I totally understand. But you would think that if you live there, that um, you'd be used to that. Yeah, and the guy lived there for like 30 years. So <laughs> either, either he really wasn't paying attention or he never looked in that direction before. Uh, we've fun. recently gone on, we have a lot of sightings right now, a lot of reports, not sightings, but reports in Pennsylvania of a cryptid type of creature for that we've already had one expedition. We got three, four, five, six more scheduled in different parts of PA. Most of them are occurring in central Pennsylvania of people seeing this unknown, uh, creature of sorts. And when we went out there, their technology was beat because the woods were so thick uh, that <laughs> I had one of my guys walk in five steps and I lost him. So cameras would have been useless. So it was just one of those sit for a couple of days and listen and uh, see if we could pick up anything that way. And we walked around with thermal imaging devices, which we have on the trucks, and uh, the thermal cameras picked up nothing. So yeah. I thought that kind of strange, being that I was in the middle of 4,500 acres of prime game land that was just teething with animals. And... Um, we heard nothing, saw nothing, didn't hear one sound, had nothing recorded on any of the cameras that we did have up, like the GoPros and stuff. Yeah. So now we went a little different this time. We got, uh, we just got cameras, two new cameras. Uh, they're surveillance cameras, and they'll take a photograph every half second. Hmm. And uh, they cover a 150-degree angle, wide angle. So with two of those, we should be able to pick up a pretty large piece of real estate and photograph it. Now I heard uh, Stan. I was talking to Stan Gordon, um, mm-hmm. and there's a you know he was saying how many different like cryptic things are going on in Pennsylvania, and mm-hmm. this uh, p- one particular <clears throat> person that was reporting this unusual. I think that's what you used. Um, what can you describe what they thought they were seeing? Oh uh, well, they all every every report we have, everybody describes the same thing. Uh, we don't have anybody that veers off from the original description that we really? started back in July of 2014. Seven eight foot tall, uh, massive chest, muscular arms with hands, uh, uh, hawk dog's leg, uh, very thin waisted, wolf like head, uh, glowing yellow eyes, and it stands its ground. It does not run. It does not hide. And they're all saying the same thing, and there's no way this could be some type of hoax? Nope. No way. These people have no idea. And what really set me straight on that in the very beginning of the research, which is going into its third year now, is the fact that I found reports, exact reports, that I could match up against the report that I got two months ago from 1865 in western Pennsylvania. Oh, jeez. Now, um, someone posted up on the message board, the Jersey <clears throat> Devil. Jersey Devil. Does that have anything to do with this? No, totally, totally different. The, the, this is more. Uh, well, I saw somebody just posted werewolf. Yeah, you could probably get it close to uh, more of a werewolf or maybe a skinwalker, um, oh. because uh, you know, like Bigfoot, they hide. They they don't want to be seen. This thing, if you see it, and like the last guy that saw one, uh, he was just walking in, and and, oh, and they all take place in a state park. No place outside of a state park do we have any. These are all taking place in heavily wooded areas, uh, uh, game areas, and, and, and state open park areas, which are very large parks. And uh, the uh, last guy was um, standing less than 30 feet away when he saw it, and it never took his eyes off him. He kept his eyes on it, and he started backing out. And it just stared at him. It just followed him all the way out the trail with its eyes. And, uh, I mean, this this guy still shakes and shammers when he talks to me about it. So, oh, I, can't, uh, I can't imagine seeing something like that. You know what uh, I mean? Well, I'm, hoped, I'm hoping to see something like that, but I just don't really, to be honest with you and your listeners, I don't have any idea what I'm looking at or what I'm looking for. Because, number one, you know, there's protocols for investigating the paranormal. There are protocols for investigating a UFO sighting. There's no protocol for investigating anything like this. Right. At all. Yeah. And, you know, the indigenous population of, of the United States, uh, the Cherokee especially, use, you know, the wolf is mostly their sightings as a wolf creature with their um, skinwalkers. So... And skinwalkers are not very nice. I mean, they're very dangerous from what we've gathered from those folks out there in Oklahoma and from what we've read up on. And, you know, what it is, I have no idea. 
I'm trying to keep an open mind about it. And until I get something on film, which is probably all I'm going to be able to do, uh, I really don't even know what I'm looking for. Now, is there any Native American uh, culture in that area? You know, uh, when I think time, of Skinwalker. In Pennsylvania, we had no white men in Pennsylvania until 1754. Hmm. Up until then, this was Indian Territory. Mm-hmm. There were, uh, I believe, nine tribes. Susquehannock were the biggest. There were Iroquois, Mohawk, uh, Susquehannock, um, uh, Delaware. Uh, so the Susquehannock were the biggest. Uh, they were the warringest tribes. They were at war with everybody. And, um, you know, it's so the place is full of burial grounds. And when we contacted uh, people, uh, indigenous out in Oklahoma, and talked to a medicine man and a, and a chief, uh, they told us that, you know, being that the ground was just loaded with burial sites, that you could be dealing with um, a skinwalker that is um, basically guarding over those sites. And he warned us right up front, don't touch anything, don't take anything. If you do find something, don't take it. Leave it lay. And they sent, us, they sent us some stuff to help protect us, which I have no idea what that's all about, but we will do what they say. And uh, only because I have no idea what to do. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm out there throwing technology at something that I don't even know I'm throwing it at. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, pardon me. So we, we try to stick, um, uh, you know, this, this kind of thing really fascinates me, and we tr- do try to stick more to the UFO topic because mm-hmm. we have a, you know, a lot of people listen to the show uh, for mm-hmm. that particular reason. But um, I don't care if we, you know, spin off a little bit here and there on things like that sure. it really is interesting to me. <clears throat> and it just, to me, it just goes along um, to mm-hmm. along with uh, UFOs in a way that is just mm-hmm. another unexplainable, you know, yeah, or, and, and, and like one person said to me, uh, how do we know that it's not something from a UFO or from a from the paranormal? Right now, linking the paranormal uh, at, into one big subject, which would be ufology, cryptozoology, and of course ghost hunting, uh, is not so far away. Um, there have been uh, paranormal events that have taken place where lights have been seen in the sky. There have been lights seen in the sky where something strange took place on the ground, whether it was a uh, uh, a, a crypto uh, sighting or a paranormal event. So uh, I don't think they're that far apart anymore. I mean, at one time they had held their own separate little rooms, but I just don't see that anymore. I mean, more and more researchers are trying to connect uh, one with the other, uh, where I just read an article where a, a ghost hunting group, and that's all they do is hunt ghosts, uh, they are now setting up cameras facing the sky while they're in doing what they're doing. And they're trying to see if anything goes on in the place that they're investigating inside, if anything's going on in the sky outside, which I thought was a, a pretty neat trick. Mm-hmm. Mike, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things, the, I think UFOs gets uh, a little bit of a separation. Now, I do realize there's a heck of a lot of unexplained things. I've had a few things happen in my life that were unexplainable, that were mm-hmm. really interesting, still are. Um, mm-hmm. But I think UFOs are a little different in a way that, um, you know, the mass sightings, uh, the radar returns, all, all that, um, whatever it is that mm-hmm. um, there seem to be so much closer to grasp than mm-hmm. uh, some of the other things that we uh, encounter, like ghosts and Cryptoids well, sure, and one like of the that. biggest things is, I mean, you can you can look at tons of evidence on UFOs. I mean, we still get, on the average, about seven or eight reports of glowing orange orbs in, in our state. Uh, we've got a very good picture of one, uh, which was taken by a, a student at a university. We have, um, it's uh, just... Uh, triangles, tri- triangles and orbs right now in the last, I would say, three years are the most that we're getting um, uh, reports on. The right. uh, last one being one of my guys, who's actually a police officer, was coming home from work, and he spotted one crossing the highway above him. 
and you know turned around and tried to follow it as long as he could. You talking but it was about a moving very slowly. Or a, or a orb? Uh, no, this was a triangle. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, very large, uh, and um, it just. Uh, he said it was so so large it had to make a noise, but it made no noise whatsoever. Because he stopped the car and got out right along the highway, and he said, I didn't hear a thing. And he said it passed right over top of me. And it had two uh, very small uh, lights uh, in the middle, um, which really weren't any particular color. He said it was just it was like looking at an old lava lamp, if you remember those. Oh, yeah. And... Um, then not too long after that sighting, we had another one in um, in Exeter, Pennsylvania, which is right down the road from the other sighting of a similar object, uh, again, a triangle, but it was followed by three orbs above it, and the orbs Weird. were red in color. Yeah. And they got some pictures, but they used a camera, a phone camera, and it didn't really, really outline the triangle. You could see the, you could see the orbs, but not make the, out the... Um, the triangle too well yeah now um there's there was some up on the chat room there are people saying that one guy says i miss the saucers i love that um well you know what there there hasn't been i haven't seen or read of any reports of saucers in years i mean they're either coming through as cigar shape triangle uh squares yeah uh, orbs mm-hmm. um Another one that started popping up about two years ago was a um, a long, uh, flat rectangle. So I don't, you know, uh, the, the classic saucer, I haven't seen one of those reports in years. I've seen some photographs that were taken or supposedly taken recently. But when you look at the photographs, you can, you know, it'll take you five minutes to figure out that they were photoshopped. Wow. You know, that was the sighting I had in 2006 was... Definitely a, a disc. And, mm-hmm. you know, you're right. I've talked about that a number of times that it seems like, you know, maybe that's the old model and the new model is the triangle. <laughs> you know, this yeah. year's model. Um, but, yeah. no, it's really strange. Um, I think it's strange that it would change or that we'd be seeing something different. And that s- could be something simple, like if we are being visited from uh, another uh, species out there, let's just say, uh, I never like to say we are definitely it's e- definitely extraterrestrial. I, I would say it's most likely or it could be. But, well, you know, when you investigate this stuff, after a while, it, you better have a really open mind mm-hmm. because I know uh, I've read things, I've seen things, I've been involved in things that for the life of me, with all the technology we have, I can't figure out. Nobody else can either, and I've, I've, I've got... 64 people that I can show this to or or talk to about something, and if they can't come up with anything and I can't come up with anything, you know, it's just another thing. It's unexplainable. But when you see something travel across the sky from horizon to horizon, zigzagging all the way in a matter of an eye blink or two, that's not ours. We don't have anything that fast. Mm -hmm. Or you're standing there talking with a state trooper, and he says, oh, what's that? And you see something zigzagging, and it stops drops, makes a U, and comes back up and then continues on its way, and he doesn't think anything of it because he sees them all the time. That's the first time I've ever seen one in my life like that. Uh So, you know, it's whatever's out there, whether it be ufology, the paranormal, cryptozoology, we have answers for some things, and we have others that we have no answers for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know, and you know, that's one of the main reasons I'd like to do this show is just to, uh, I'm not thinking that it's most likely that I will ever know what the heck is going on, but it's always to, the interesting part is to explore here, uh, people's sightings and also people's ideas on what they may be seeing or what they possibly could be. That that's one of the things that really keeps me in it. Yeah, and and I like I like calling myself a skeptical believer because, you know, without the evidence or proof, you're just telling me another story. Mm-hmm. And I've heard and read thousands of those. Uh so, um, you know, I try to stay um on a level path with this. 
you know, it could be this, it could be that, or it could not be this, or it could not be that. And then, you know, make up my own mind, write my report, and that's it. Now, why, while we're on this subject along these lines, mm-hmm. why do you think um, someone in the science field doesn't want to try to really look at this hard? Now, there are some people, but it's few and far in between. Well, it, it's the same, most likely the same reason that the government's never going to disclose anything. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that say, oh, well, disclosure is going to happen next week, next month, next year. You're never going to have any disclosure because for them to disclose, they'd have to admit to lying for the last 50 or so years. Yeah. And the same thing happens with scientists who've been poo-pooing it now for whatever time. Uh, if it does came to those guys, their credibility would be shot in a millisecond. So it's easier to stand there and be a skeptic than it is to be a, uh, a prover of truth and evidence. Um, and even do, even then when you do come out with proof and evidence, uh, somebody will come after you and say you manufactured it. You know, it's just a big hassle. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I often laugh. Uh, people say, well, when do you think there'll be disclosure? I said, when somebody, one of those things lands in some farmer's yard and he's smart enough to call the news before he calls the police. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, I, I talked, I had a, a conversation a while ago with uh, Dr. Melba uh, Ketchum, mm-hmm. um, you know, the Bigfoot DNA uh, research. And, yes. you know, she like just, a very nice lady, by the way, and, and she just, you know, threw caution to the wind and all her background and many years of uh, uh her work that she she has done, she can now no longer uh, testify in court, um, you know, many things, because she just took this subject seriously, and that's what can, that's what can happen. And she's had uh, death threats. She's had a place where she was going to speak. Someone actually bombed it just, you know, prior to when she was going to be there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's well. amazing um, where, you know, people can just... Uh, People don't want to um, have anything, something big like this looked at seriously, it seems. Well, no, well, they don't because, I mean, uh, first of all, look at how many folks, uh, but let me put it to you this way. I have 12 books here on my shelf I'm looking at in the monks, 1,500 of them, but there's 12 on the shelf I keep separately. They're all written by different authors. They're all on Roswell Crash, every one of them. Hmm. Which one am I supposed to believe? Are they all, pardon me, are they all different accountings? All different. Everyone is different by a different author, so which one do I believe? <laughs> Good point, yeah. And and you have, you have, uh, um, uh, this guy says this, and then this guy says, well, that guy's nuts, this is what really happened, and then that guy says, this guy's crazy, because that's not what happened, the first guy was right, or sort of right, but my idea is better. And then they wonder why people are confused when they talk about UFOs or they talk to people about UFOs. I mean, they've been fed garbage for so long that, Mm -hmm. you know, I would say out of all these books, (laughs) there might be a dozen or two that I may say would be close to factual. And then when you find out that the people who wrote these books never saw a UFO or never went out in the field and investigated a UFO, that's a little disheartening to me. Yeah, um... I, I understand what you're saying, um, but I I think there are some good people out there that are trying to do a yeah. good thing. Oh, that absolutely. There are people out there an excellent yeah. job. MUFON mm-hmm. has a crap load of good investigators, mm-hmm. but they're kind of hampered because when they do an investigation, that investigation ends when they turn it into a CMS file. Huh. Well, and that's let's, the end of it. Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, I don't want to move on bash, but um, there's... Oh, no, absolutely not. But I do get, I actually do get a lot of contacts from people that are, uh, that do feel that way and feel like a lot of things are not available to, you know, do more work on. And uh, that's one of the things. But that, people um, have to hear. understand that, you know, you're talking about an organization that's got a lot of folks. And if they had to equip those people and get them all out in the field, that would be tons of money. Mm hmm. And the independent researchers, you know, uh, uh, like J.C. Johnson that investigates paranormal things out in the four corners of this country, I mean, he's self-funded, 
and he travels all over four states. But if he was with MUFON or any other large group, he couldn't do that because they're not going to fund him to do that. You know, they wouldn't, they're not going to fund my $90,000 truck with equipment out there. No way. So, although there are, and, and we have MUFON members in my group, and they're very good, and they've been there a long time, and they know what they're doing. And, uh, but I have more, I give them more access and the benefit of having the equipment they need on a spur of the moment, which I don't think MUFON can do till this day. Hmm. They couldn't when I was involved as a star team member and, and, a, and a chief investigator. They couldn't do it then. I don't think they could do it now. So when you were, when you were an investigator, did you ever hear any rumblings of, um, you know, the possible CIA connection with MUFON? Oh, yeah. I think that probably started at day number two after they started, the, started MUFON. Uh, well, everybody's going to look for something to discredit somebody. It, it doesn't matter. They'll say, you know, MUFON's owned by Bob Bigelow, or uh, MUFON is um, a, go- a government agency in a clandestine operation. Uh, MUFON throws away their reports. That's all silly. That's, that's not factual. Uh, MUFON is just a big organization that collects a lot of data and has a lot of investigators out there collecting data. So uh, as far as that goes, uh, I give them kudos because I, you know, I did it with them. I did it for them. And it takes a lot of work, and it's out-of-pocket expenses, not as much as doing it on your own, but uh, it's uh, they'll be around for a long time. I mean, I know people are saying that I've heard and I've read on the Internet that, you know, they're going to uh, – uh, you know, just getting done. You know, they're just going to fold. They're going to do this, and it's going to happen next month and next month and next month. Hmm. That's silly. It's just nonsense. MUFON will be around a long time. It's a good operation. Uh, <laughs> how they how they control all those people is beyond me. I don't know what they have thirty five hundred members or something like that. It's uh, it's yeah, crazy. It's about thirty five hundred. Right? <laughs> That's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Now there was. We actually had a uh, guest on the show, and he, you know, he's probably, he does listen to the show, who mm-hmm. actually had firsthand, uh, a firsthand incident that happened right in front of them was a actual tie at one point. This is going back into the 1980s, where uh, a convention, if you, if, um, if you are listening, and you are welcome to call in and uh, share your story once more, he was on. Uh, a while back, 603-967-4030 is the number if anyone wants to call in and ask our uh, guest a question. So I don't know. You know, I mean, <clears throat> I, I, you know, the thing you do here is that they were infiltrated or whatever because they wanted to know what information that was being gathered out there. Whether that's true or whether they'd even bother, I have no idea. Why would they bother? I mean, they got the CIA, the DOD, they got spooks all over the place. <clears throat> they wanted to find out something about you, me, or anybody else, or any any group that's out there. They could do that without them ever knowing about it. They wouldn't have to uh, buy the business or you know infiltrate the business. They could just do it. End yeah. of story. My, you my know, s- they could watch all their email. They could yeah. watch every conversation. They could listen to everything they're saying, and they wouldn't know the difference. So I, I think that's just you know the conspiracy theories kind of make me crazy because I was just going to say I was just going to ask you if I sounded like a conspiracy. <laughs> Well, you know, you could make a conspiracy, you know, give me your birth date and I'll make a conspiracy out of it, you know? Uh, you can make a conspiracy out of anything, but the, the, when you want to get to the real bottom line, you've got to deal with fact, mm-hmm. fact and evidence. That's what you need. You need to have the evidence. You need to have the facts. Uh, c- could it happen? Did it not happen? Uh, go to the scene. Talk to the people face-to-face. I don't do any uh interviews with anybody unless they're out of state uh, or they're too far away to go um, over the internet or by phone. I I try to do everything Uh, uh, face-to-face because I can see what they're talking about. I can see what facts they're going to present. I'm -hmm. looking at them right in the eye, you know, and they're showing me what they saw, where they saw it, and I can, you know, do a lot of things to find out if that could happen or not. Um, that circle in their yard that's been growing now over the damp season for the last two years is mold. <laughs> you know, I didn't carry a sample of it to show them. 
so it's not a crop circle, uh, or it's not a landing site of a UFO. And, um, uh, you know, we've investigated, uh, well, a little over 2,500 cases now since 2009. Yeah, and I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the cases you've investigated. But before that, um, before you make the trip out to actually speak to someone, what type of uh, preliminary uh, information do you need before you actually pack up your truck and, and go there? Okay, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll, of course, take the original location. And um, then we'll do a background on the location, see if there are any other sightings in that area, that county, uh, that street, or whatever. And um, uh, see, uh, try to get as much as we can historically, uh, doing some background research from years back. I'll go back sometimes, you know, five to ten years and and if you know if there's the same lights being seen in the same time in the same place over a period of five or ten years, well then I'm probably dealing with something that's man made mm-hmm. uh you know uh, especially when somebody gives you explicit directions like um, um I see it in the northwest sky every every once a month or something like that, it usually turns out to be either a satellite or a um uh, a planet. And uh, then you have uh, weather is very important. Um, yep. And then when you get on the scene, you know, and you hear the story, now did the story change from the time I got the report to the time now that I'm on the scene? That's another kicker that gets me. You know, the story changes. Oh, uh, yeah. Or we get a me-tooism. And That's... a me-tooism is the neighbor coming over. When he sees the truck parked out front and says, yeah, I saw it. Me too. I saw it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, background research is very important before you even get to the, get to the scene. I mean, you have to know what your, what the background is of the area. Uh, is there, is there an air force base or is there a testing area for missiles nearby or is there anything nearby that could, you know, that could cause what they saw. And then you just take it from there and then just follow up on it and just keep going until you come to your conclusion. Yeah, with everything you have invested in your time, it's you want to make sure no one's going to waste it. That's for sure. Yeah, well, and and, and I don't. I, I've had it wasted, but sometimes the waste is good because something will always come up where they'll say, "Well, you know, the the guy that owns the bar down the street, you know, he saw something one time about." And you go down to the bar and you talk to that guy, hmm. you know, and he may put you in a better direction, or maybe he'll back up what the other guy said, or vice versa. Yeah, right. Now, um, someone just in the message room wanted to know, what are some of the cases you've investigated? Well, we have some active ones right now that have been going on for years. Um, I see a lot of on your chat room about Todd Cease. That's still an ongoing case. Um, the Todd Cease case started in 2008, and we've been on it ever since. Um, we have a cold case unit that works the case. And um, it's uh, it's probably the strangest case I've ever investigated on anything. I, I'm not familiar with it, and I'm, I imagine. Well, I can give you. I'll yeah, give imagine. you a quick. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Todd Cease was a gentleman, uh, 34 years old, that um, one morning, uh, as he did many times during deer, pre deer season would get on his ATV and go up into the woods, a very heavily wooded area in Northumberland, Pennsylvania, and look for deer, spot deer for the coming season. He was an avid archer. And uh, he was last seen uh, that day uh, at 1 a.m. and uh, uh, got on his ATV and took off into the woods and told his wife he'd be back like at... uh, uh, yeah, somebody just corrected me, 39. Yeah, okay. Uh, trying to remember everything about this case from the beginning. Uh, he um, went into the woody, wooded area and uh, didn't return. And at 2 o'clock, the family got nervous, and uh, the wife called the police, reported him missing. Family members showed up, brothers, father, and they all went looking for him, son, um, trying to find him. They couldn't find him. They did locate the ATV. They saw the ATV. Uh, which was approximately one mile from the home. Uh, they brought they, they couldn't bring it back because they couldn't find the keys, and they wound up towing it back later. But uh, the search went on. Uh, about 235 searchers, we found out, were the actual searchers that showed up, which would have been local police, two fire, three fire companies, two search dog teams, um, 
uh, one cadaver dog and one well, one set of cadaver dogs and one set of bloodhounds. Uh, there was a, a state police helicopter in the sky. There were uh, state troopers on the scene also. Um, uh, many people that knew him, um, a lot of folks, relatives, everybody out looking for him. And uh, nobody finds this guy. And um, uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, we have not posted very much on this case on the Internet because it's still ongoing. But uh, everything that we have gotten uh, on the case, uh, we don't rely on the original reporting of the case, uh, which was all taken from a newspaper, uh, which was doctored many times and has now been taken off the newspaper archives since we've been investigating. Uh, everything we've gotten so far in the last six years is in black and white. Uh, we've had everything done where we didn't ask anybody for a phone answer. We got everything uh on their letterheads, uh, we have the autopsy report, we have the toxicology report. And what happened was that uh, they didn't find him the first day. The second day, uh, they didn't find him uh, till um, it was about 7-something in the evening, 7.54, I believe it was, that the body was located. Uh, he was identified and um, removed from the scene. Um, autopsy followed and he was found to have uh, died of a cocaine toxology uh, overdose of cocaine now kind of a simple thing right mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out that he had no drug abuse background we could find no arrest records other than a traffic ticket all his personal information like on the social security death site and um, military records driver's license hunting license none of that even appears anymore anywhere he's pretty much been wiped clean. Um, family doesn't talk about it. Family lied to us a couple times. We caught them on that, and it's all in black and white. I mean, it was emails back and forth with family members. Um, the, the coroner lied to us. Uh, the police lied to us. Police said they were the investigating team. It turned out they weren't. The state police were. Um, the body was in, uh, how can I say this? The body was in horrendous shape when it was found. It was in the adva way advanced stages of, of decomposition. Um, and um, the kicker is that this body was only 20 yards from the house when it was found. Oh, jeez. So where does and, the cocaine play into this whole thing? Well, that's what was given as the cause of death. And, and it's a mystery because he had no background, no... Uh, not only did he have no background, but when we took all the toxicology reports and stuff that we have directly from where they came, were supposed to come from, the coroner, when we took all that official paperwork to other doctors and pathologists, they said the amount of cocaine, degraded cocaine that was in his body would have killed him within a matter of a couple minutes. Huh. There is no way he could have walked from that ATV back to his house. And besides that, if you have a decomposing body in the middle of the summer, laying in your backyard, 20 foot from your back door, and 15 feet from the road that all these searchers were driving up and walking up to get to the search scene. Didn't smell this guy? Yeah. Cadaver dogs? I've worked with cadaver dogs. They can find a body six foot under dirt, no problem. They can wow. find a body under water. So... Did, um, I'm going to say this. Did David Pallades ever look into this? No. Do you no, know who David, I'm you know. Yeah, 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 I know David very well. Now, David is more on the missing persons yeah. uh, end of it. Uh, this this guy wasn't really a missing person, but for, I forget how many hours now, off the top of my head. But he, uh, uh, this is a guy whose background had nothing to do with drugs of any types, of any type. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you wanted to kill this guy for whatever reason, in that area, you could walk up in the middle of the night or when he went up there, like 5 a.m. or whatever it was, and shot him in the head. Nobody would have paid any attention because the place is loaded with rattlesnakes. They have the, the rattlesnake roundup there every year. So gunshots going off day and night in those woods means nothing. Or you could have just walked up and hit him in the head with a hammer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So how does, how does this happen that the guy disappears and nobody sees this guy or smells this guy? Well, then the family said, well, it rained that day. Well, I was quite quick to print you know i could check that in a matter of minutes check that and i said yeah it did rain that day she said that's why they didn't smell him i said well 
that's a little hard to believe because your area for that day only received 0.01 inches of rain. Uh, that doesn't even get my windshield wet. Now, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, becoming familiar to me, I believe. Um, was he like uh, um, either mangled or something was really weird about him as well? His what? Was he like mangled or something? No. Uh, mm-hmm. Or charred? Someone... No. In the very, very first information that came out about this case was a UFO researcher, uh, Peter Davenport, that was garnering all his information from the newspaper. And, uh, I mean, the newspaper lady said she was even one of the people that, in her news article, original news articles, which are no longer available, she took them all off, said that she identified him. Well, then the chief of police said he identified him. Then the father said he identified him. Then the brother said he identified him. And then uh, 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 a, um, a local police officer, he, he identified him. So we have all these five or six people identified him. But till this day, we do not know who identified the body. That's really strange. That sounds and like a real bizarre fact, case. All, all, his, all his personal information is just missing. It's gone. It's not there. It's not there. His, uh, you know, on the Social Security Death Index, which anybody can look up, look up your grandfather. It'll have who he was married to, when he got married, where he worked, where he lived, uh, um, you know, where he was born, where he went to school, uh, and all this information, how many kids he had, the names of the kids, when they were born. That's all in the Social Security Death Index. You know what's on his? What? J. C. S. Born, blah, 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 died, blah, blah, blah. Rest blank. Very unusual. No, that's, that's, un, that's not unusual. That's outrageous. I mean, there is nothing about this guy. Now, to get to, back to the beginning of the story, the day of the sighting, okay, a UFO report went in that said that there was an object uh, uh, above the power lines, which is where the ATV was found. There's a big power line that runs up along his property. He has 10 acres. And uh, they, two fishermen and one farmer down the road say that they see what looks like to be a guy in his underwear being pulled up into this craft. Yeah. Okay, and then the craft takes off. Now, when he is found, there are many people saying... Uh, he was found like this, and he was found like this, and he was facing that way, and he's facing this way. And face- well, in the autopsy reports, it tells you exactly how he was found. He was found in his um, uh, cut-off shorts. He actually had started out with a, uh, a full-body, um, oh, what do they call them, a one-piece suit, mm-hmm. uh, camouflage. Okay, well, when he's found, he is found in his cut-off jeans, a T-shirt, and socks. Wow. So that matches that matches what that UFO report said that those gentlemen saw. Hmm. Now, everybody plays off on that and says, "Well, uh, you know, this, that, and whatever." And um, I'm, I'm just reading some of the comments coming across your your uh, thing here. It just said the FBI was involved. No, the FBI was not involved. And law, local law enforcement had nothing to do with the case whatsoever. The case was handled by the Pennsylvania State Police, uh, right down to the viewing of the autopsy and the taking of evidence from the autopsy scene. Um, so uh, a lot of stories floated about that. But I can tell you this. When I started this investigation, I had a little half-inch binder with about 20 pages in it. I now have two eight-inch binders that are filled huh. with with documented evidence of what happened, who said what, when it happened, who was there, who wasn't, where the body was found. We've gone to the scene, to the house. The house uh, was taken to sheriff's sale after it was actually sold by his wife, and then whoever bought it defaulted on their loan, and it was uh, went to sheriff's sale. And um, uh, we actually got to walk the property, photograph and video the property inside and out. And we found the tree it was found under. It's the only dead tree on the property, and it's, a, it's it, to be exact, it's 22.5 yards from the back door. Yards, uh-huh. And wow. from this road that goes up along the house uh, that takes you into the woods where he would have went with his ATV to uh, go up through there, he, um, was, I think it was 16 feet and 4 inches, right, edge to edge, edge of the tree to edge of the road. Now, to believe their story or the story that's being told, 
all these researchers had to walk past this guy for two days. He's in a case of advanced decomposition that is impossible to happen in that short a period of time. Um, uh, sure the, seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not strange. It's bizarre because everybody r- relates back to the original case. And even when I talked about it originally, I was, you know, I was wrong because I, I didn't have that information then that I have now. I didn't talk to people in, or, or family members or the coroner or the police or the state police or anything like that. We just had one of our guys up there last April. Mm-hmm. The police, he went to the police station to get information on a FOIA request that we sent, and we've not had one FOIA request from that police department answered. Not one. We haven't had one of our FOIA requests answered by the state police either. Uh, we've been told that they can't give that information out because it is an open case. Now, the death has been attributed to cocaine toxicity, so it's not an open case. The death has been documented as cocaine toxicity. So the only way you can keep an open case in the state murder. of Pennsylvania yeah. is murder. Mm-hmm. So murder by who? Now that takes us in another direction. Did he owe somebody money? Was he messing around with somebody's wife? Or, but, I mean, it looks like they went to a great length to you know, put that much cocaine into a guy. I mean, if you're using cocaine, there are certain things that happen to the body. I mean, the heart especially, the lungs, the nose. Uh, um, uh, uh, different things fail, but they, they show a telltale sign. His body was as clean as a pin. Hmm. Other than scrapes and bruises and bangs and knocks and a few lacerations, the body was pretty much undocumentable. He had no signs of enlarged heart or kidney issues or liver issues or, or nasal issues or throat issues, but yet he was this, according to them, this wild cocaine-using fanatic who, when we talked to the Boy Scout, I mean the um, uh, Little League baseball team that he coached for many, many years, they just laughed at us and they said, look, this guy even had the slightest inkling of doing any kind of drugs. Do you think we let him around these kids? You're crazy. He said, this guy didn't die of cocaine. Mm. And here's the kicker. So from the time the body's picked up till the time it hits the autopsy table, we have 14 hours where we don't know where that body is. Wow. So. What a crazy case. You're telling me, man. Wow. And I know uh, we're going into the second hour, ran a little long into this, uh, but... That's fine. I wanted to um, switch gears a little bit, but also kind of along this same uh, subject, I want to talk, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, that we're going to go a a bit off the UFO topic, and that is uh, possibly off the UFO topic. Who knows? But human mutilations, kind of similar. But before we get into that, um, you mentioned that you also do a lot of abduction or you do some abduction uh, investigations. And yes, we do. That to investigate an abduction must be much harder to do than a UFO sighting. How does that work? Well, abduction cases are usually, I mean, uh, an abduction case that really catches your, your mind are abduction cases that usually come from folks that all of a sudden have a recollection of something that happened 20 years ago. And they're not involved in ufology. They, don't, they wouldn't know how to go buy a ufology book or an abduction book if they had to. Um, they're distraught. They're they're pretty much physically, mentally destroyed by it. They're very. Um, they know what they saw. They know what they went through, and they describe it in very great detail. Uh, they don't. Um, how should I say? They don't flutter around with uh, descriptions of what they thought may have happened to them. Uh, they're pretty much right on the money, and. Uh, uh, a lot of things happened in childhood. Uh, a lot of things happened, um, you know, that just, you just shaking your head, you know, I mean, it's like, wow. <laughs> and when you do get into one, that's a really good case. You'll find that it wasn't only that child that was seemingly abducted, but it was the brother, the sister, the mother, the uncle, the father, the grandfather, it ran through the whole family. And, um, it's that's when you start bringing in specialists. You know, I start bringing in people that that's all they do. You know, I'll take all the initial stuff, and then I'll I'll transmit that to one of our folks, maybe in Florida or Georgia, 
who that's all they do and have done for many, many years. As a matter of fact, uh, Denise Stoner, one of the folks that uh, yeah. is, runs our, our, our Florida group, uh, her and Kathleen Martin wrote a book together um, on right. abductions, and she's very active with MUFON as an abduction uh, uh, specialist. So I really take it so far, and then I'll turn it over to them. And if they're busy, then it'll go to Dr. David Jacobs. Now, when you were saying uh, you go through all this, you hear, or I, I hear uh, everywhere, that it's like more and more and more people yes. are claiming. Yes. And you're seeing yes. that as well? Yes. We've had a about um, a, I'm going to say to, to be on the safe side, about a 20% increase in the last two years of abduction reports. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty high. Pretty high. That's a lot. And, you know... I hear the number. Sometimes you hear people say, you know, in the possibly in the millions and just, you know, like a percentage of our society, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you hear this. And I don't know, um, you, you know, even if a small, tiny, well, let's just put it this way. Even if one out of those supposed millions actually was abducted, that would be big time news. Well, when I first started doing uh, statistics, trying to find out just about how many people were ever reported missing, I mean, that set me back in my chair. I couldn't talk for 20 minutes. Uh, I went back it's to huge, 2008. Yeah. I used the NCI statistics, which is the National Crime Information Center put out by the F FBI. That means that, that when people see uh, in their newspaper or they might get a, a blurb or something uh, on the Internet, they'll say, that, you know, that uh, such and such town – uh, here's their crime report for the last year while well, they always run a year behind. So, um, and on that report, which every police department in this country, I don't care if sheriff, uh, uh, state police, uh, local police, it doesn't matter if they're law enforcement, they have to fill this form out. And on the form, it'll ask questions. It's kind of like yes or no, or how many, uh, how many bicycles were stolen? How many rapes did you have? How many murders occurred? How many gun thefts did you have? You know, that kind of stuff. And that's how they tally the uh, crime statistics for the country. Okay? Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. And also on there is missing person reports, murders, runaways, the whole bit. So I went back and researched that. It's open to the public. Anybody can do it. So I started in uh, 1991. And uh, uh, I actually started, I did the first research in 2008, and I came up with, it, it had 778,164 missing persons filed. Now, 95% of those are found, not like David's stuff. I was going to ask you about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. About 95% are found, not like David's part where pretty much nobody's ever found. And now, about 75% of those are runaways under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. About 20% are spousal abuse, murders, elderly walkaways, ransom, you know, kidnapping, that kind of stuff. But 5%, 5% are never found. So that, uh, just for 2008, that means that, 38,908 people were never found, wow. okay? So I went back to 1991 and to totaled all the missing reports from 1991, and that came up to 13,861,065. Using the same math, with that 5%, it showed that 693,053 people are never found. No trace. Man, woman, child. No clothing, no body, no nothing. Now, so, if they were found, like, five years later, would it... You know, like living somewhere? Yep, uh, it would take it off. It, it would, would take, take them it off. off. Yep. Wow. Oh, in 17 years, you had 40,795 people gone off the face of this planet. Totally amazing. And someone could be, say, murdered and buried or something like that. Uh, that yeah, yeah. That that. yeah. But the 5% means that they've never been found. Mm. No, no trace has ever been found. No body, no parts, no clothing, no nothing. And we're not talking about criminals here or wild maniacs or anything like that. We're talking about everyday people. So now the United States does this through the FBI. But now take a country like, say, South Africa or just Africa, where whole villages have disappeared. They don't take any statistics. So whether there were 50 people in that village or 5,000 people in the village, they're gone. Uh, China doesn't do it. I mean, places that have these – Europe, nobody in Europe does this. So they have no idea how many people are missing. So if you look at the 40,700 a year since 1991, 
what's that say about the rest of the world? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's amazing, really is. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty scary, actually. Yes, it is. Think about it. Um, so now I heard one of the lectures I listened to what you were talking about. You got into the um, human mutilations. And where do you think mm-hmm. the connections, how does all that fit into everything? Well, back in the early 60s, rumors were all about, you know, they came to the forefront of human corpses were being found with strange wounds, like the type, the same type found in cattle, cattle mutilations. Mm-hmm. And they were just dismissed as in bad taste by most ufologists. Nobody wanted to get involved in that. And until today, it's still the black part of uh, ufology that's really never talked about. But I started looking into it because I was looking at actually cattle mutilations. And I started coming up with all these cases. And I felt like, well, wow, man, there's a lot of cases here. So the one that really struck home right off the get-go was a Guadaparanga Dam in Brazil case and took place in 1988. Uh, the Guadaparanga Dam is a uh, man-made dam that supplies water to Sao Paulo. Mm-hmm. A very great fishing spot for the locals also. So a couple of guys in a boat are out doing their fishing thing, and they spot what they see is a body, looks like a body on the shore. So instead of being like most people would go check it out, these guys went and got the cops. So the cops showed up, and they show up with a forensic team. Yay for our side. That doesn't usually happen. (laughs) So at the crime scene, this guy is found uh, with the following items surgically removed. His eyes, his left ear, his inner ear, lower jaw, inner throat and tongue, There are one inch to one and a half inch holes in the following areas of his body, which were the muscle, tissue, glands, all removed, shoulder, chest, navel, thigh, testicles removed, prostate gland was removed via the urethral tube. Intestines were removed via a hole in the navel. Anus was cored out to the colon. Body presented no signs of bloating, which in itself I think is pretty remarkable due to the high heat in that area at that time of year. He should have been blown up like a balloon, and there was no body odor whatsoever. Neither was there any blood found at the scene other than some speckles of blood around the, around the wounds themselves. He is uh, laying there. Um, uh, all the photos are taken. The body was never touched till everything was done, so it was really done properly in the right order. And then we get the autopsy report, which was made public years before, years afterwards, and the death was due to massive trauma. Now, oh, the, I guess. So the really strange parts about this is uh, just the opposite of Todd Cease. This guy was, Todd was dead 40 to, I forget, 40 to 44, something like that, 50 hours or something like that. But uh, the time of death placed on this guy was 40 to 70, 72 hours before discovery. No, no bloating, no liver mortis, no rigor mortis, no noticeable blood at the scene. And one of the things that pops up in the uh, autopsy report is uh, the term vital reaction. Now, vital reaction, would use, a lot of lawyers, police use that because vital, the term vital reaction really indicates the response of a living body tissue to an injury. So if I take a knife and I stab you in the arm, you're going to pull away. Well, when you pull away, you're going to cause some ripping, tearing, blacking, blue around the wound and stuff like that. And um, it's really uh, importance in forensic medicine. Uh, it, cause it really it helps to uh, attempt to establish that an injury was inflicted before death or after death. So in other words, if you're dead and I take a knife and stick it in, you're just going to be a hole from the knife. No blood, no bleeding, no black and blue or anything like that. But um, one of the things that uh, vital reaction does mean is that in this case, when they did the autopsy, when they removed the skull, they saw massive hematomas, many hematomas, very small, but many of them. Uh, That would only be found in um, a very, um, like, say, a crushing injury where somebody was uh, pinned in a car or crushed against a wall with a piece of machinery. They didn't die right away. They were alive and all this pain, you know, they're going through all this pain, agony in their brain, you know, and all of a sudden these small blood vessels start to burst. And um, 
that really means that when this took place, when this guy was, I'll use butchered for a better use of any other word, he was alive. Ouch. Boy. Now, we have one animal mutilation like that, uh, the case of Snippy. I can't remember Snippy's real name, but that was the name the newspaper gave the, this, this, this horse. The investigators are on the scene, and the horse is laying on its side, and the um, one investigator says, there's something strange here. He says, in his words, he said, you know, the eyes were removed, and the viscous fluid uh, should have run off the horse laying on its left. It should have ran off to the left side, correct? And the guy goes, yeah. He said, well, look at this. And he's looking at the horse, and the viscous fluid actually ran straight down the nose and off the end of the nose. So the horse was upright when its eyes were removed. Jeez. So the horse was alive. God. Now, there's a researcher in Puerto Rico who's working on this now for about, I don't know how many years, probably a lot longer than I'm alive, maybe. And he says... Uh, he thinks that the our space brethren are going after endorphins. Now, what causes endorphins? If I run up to you and I say, damn, Martin, here's a million-dollar check. It's all yours. Cash. Just go spend it. Your endorphins are going to go nuts, right? They just did. The same thing yeah. would happen. Same thing would happen if I put your hand in a, meat, in, 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 a, in, a in a vice and start to turn the vice closed. Your endorphins would go crazy. So it's a good reaction, bad reaction. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to put this together with these uh, human mutilations. Now, there are a number of mutilations that have taken place. I mean, there's a number of cases. Um, they've, had them, uh, they've been documented back in, uh, over in England back into the 14th, 15th century, where they found uh, you know, a local who disappeared, and 24 hours later he, they, somebody found him hanging in a tree. And he had these strange holes in his body, and, and parts of the body interior were missing. Uh, <laughs> there's a number of those. Um, uh, another case that was really fascinating, I did get to talk to the, uh, the, the, the uh, lawyer that was handling the case for the gentleman, was in um, Cairo, Egypt, uh, in, a, in an area called Beni Mazar, which is right outside of Cairo. This took place in 2005, where... Three families were butchered, exactly like this guy. Every everything in the house was butchered. I think if they had goldfish, they were butchered. Everything was gone. Everybody was killed: man, women, children, dogs, cats, whatever. Yes. And they blamed it on a gentleman who was retarded, mentally retarded. had the had the mentality of about a four or five year old. Uh, didn't even know his own name. Um, lived thirty five miles from the scene of the crime, and they pinned the crime on him. Well, they had no other suspects, so he was likely. And uh, that case drug on for years, and then finally, uh, you know, they got him acquitted. And uh, I did get to talk to his lawyer, and till this day, till right now, if this guy wants to go outside, I don't care if he wants to go out, uh, outside of his property line. You know, he wants to go outside that wall and take a walk on the street. They have to call the police. A police officer will come and escort him. If he's going to go to the mosque to pray, police shopping, police, and if he doesn't call the police and he goes outside those parameters, he will be locked up for life. And this is someone who was acquitted? He was acquitted, yes. Unreal. Wow. But those were the conditions of him being acquitted. I see. That yeah. These things have to take place till he dies. Jeez. Wow. Um, this is a guy can't even tie his own shoes. Yeah, and 35 miles away, that's... 35 miles away, he has to have help to eat to go to the bathroom, to take a bath. I mean, this guy is basically uh, a walk-in bowl of vegetable soup. And they, to do what, to do all the things that were done to the guy in Brazil, or like are done to cattle, which are pretty much exactly the same, same organs taken, same parts, all taken the same way. Bingo. There's, wow. there's a guy nailed with it. Now, <clears throat> I have heard, uh, I don't think anyone has talked about the uh, human mutilations on this show. I've had uh, Chris O'Brien and a few other people, uh -huh. uh, Linda Moulton Howe, I think, uh, talked about a little bit on this show before. Sure. But is there, so one of the things that uh, Chris O'Brien said, a lot of times there is blood in the uh, corpse of the cattle. It's just everything, you know, settles to gravity. Um, yes, but, but not your, that much. 
Okay. I mean, if you've ever seen a cow butchered, you won't believe the amount of blood that comes out of that animal. Right. I yeah. went to an abattoir just to see it, to see, because I'd never seen it before, so I went to see it. When they open that animal up, I mean, the floor, which is probably in a room about 16 by 18, is covered in blood from one animal. hope no one's eating right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you have Chuck Kowski, who's a longtime researcher, remember MUFON. He's, as a matter of fact, he's the cattle researcher for MUFON. And uh, Chuck has also found, you know, small pools of blood here and there. But that's stuff that's draining out of small veins. I mean, we're not talking about, uh, we're talking about an animal that's been, you know, opened up front, rear, top, bottom. And you got this little, a cup or so of blood. Well, what happened to the gallons that were in there? They're not on the right. ground. They're not on the ground. Uh, and places where these animals have been found, years, many years have gone by where, uh, you can go to that exact spot, and nothing is growing there. I mean, it could be in the middle of a wheat field, and, and that, that, that animal carcass where it laid, there's nothing growing where that carcass laid. So, uh, you know, it, although there are not many researchers that do cattle mutilation, uh, they pretty much all have the same thing going as far as what they do. And one of the things Chuck was uh, really excited about was he had an EMF detector, and he was actually getting a hit on a cow recently recently killed, and he was this thing was moving. Whatever it was inside this cow's body was moving, and he was picking it up on an EMF detector. Wow. So there was something electromagnetic in that cow that was moving around in that cow, and when he got to the other side, it disappeared. <laughs> Just and he went stranger. back where he started, and it wasn't there anymore. Stranger and stranger. Now, mm -hmm. what are what are you? You mentioned that there's a lot of similarities between um, human mutilations and cattle. Yes, and well, uh, the anal areas are cored out. Uh, the uh, ears are cut. Eyes are missing. Lower jaw. Um, one of the strangest cases I worked on was actually a horse in North Dakota, where a uh, lady was riding in an indoor ring. If anybody's familiar with riding horses in an indoor ring. They, um, those rings are pristine. There's no sharp objects or anything mm -hmm. like that. They're very smooth, so the rider or the animal does not get hurt. So she stops the horse in the middle of her little thing to go get uh, something out of the tack room. The tack room is 75 feet from where she left the horse standing. Okay. When she comes back, I don't know how long it takes to walk 75 feet, got whatever she got and came back. But when she comes back, the horse's jaw is opened up from uh, right below the ear, all the way down, uh, it's, the flap is hanging open, and the lower part of its jaw is missing. Jeez. The horse is bleeding very little. The horse is not screaming. It's not running around. It's standing exactly where she left it. They oh. call a vet. vet says, there's nothing I can do for this horse. They had to put the horse down. And when she sent me those pictures, I just I couldn't believe it. So right away, somebody said, well, he ran into a nail. Well, there are no nails in a riding ring. There's nothing in a riding ring that would injure a horse or a rider because, you know, you're riding around in a ring. There's nothing there. There's just walls, and they're smooth walls, either wood or metal or whatever, but there's no, no place where the horse went. I mean, the horse was right where she left him. And he never let out a howl or a scream. Or, That's what I mean, I was, it, that just doesn't make any you sense. Slap a, you slap a horse good with a stick, that horse is going to yell. Yeah. Now, imagine this horse is standing there while somebody removes its lower jaw Unbelievable. and opens it up. I mean, this horse is opened up like it was hit with a saber. So <laughs> That is crazy. Now, um, you, there's a couple of questions that. up on the message board, and one is, uh, what does the EMF detector mean that would be moving inside the cow? The only thing that it would that Chuck's uh, thing was that there was something uh, giving off an electric magnetic pulse uh, could have been anything. I mean, uh, okay, your microwave will give off EMF, your watch will give off EMF, your your monitor will give off EMF. Uh, elect electromagnetic fields are everywhere, but why would there be an electromagnetic field in a cow? Yeah, it's pretty weird. I mean, there's yeah. no natural anomaly that could be associated with that inside of like a living being? No, no. You can take an EMF detector unless you have a heart, unless you have a pacemaker. Uh -huh. An EMF detector will just give, just like radiation. If I put a radiation detector against your body, I'm just going to pick up residual radiation, which could be from your clothing, from the air, or anything else. But to, for, to make an EMF detector move, there has to be an electromagnetic pulse. 
I see. Wow. Electromagnetic magnetic pulse in a uh, in a cow that was dead. Amazing. So Phil asks on the message board, how many human mutilations have there been reported? Uh, to date, best we know, we don't have a whole lot from England other than the fact that they gave us like seven cases to look at. Uh, in this country, um, I can tell you that in a second here, uh, I believe it's 10, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Mm-hmm. 11. In this country? Uh, and, yes. And are there variances or are they just a lot of similarities? Uh, pretty much similar. Uh, the one that would be closest to the, gen- the, the gentleman in um, Brazil was the New Zealand case in 1994, where a gentleman was found basically identically cut up just like this other guy in Brazil. Jeez. Amazing. Uh, they go back to 1956 in New Mexico at uh, uh, Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, Holloman Air Force Base, uh, Sergeant J.P. Lovett, uh, him and his colonel were going down range to pick up some parts of a missile that was fired, a test missile, and uh, the colonel heard the sergeant scream. He turned around, he saw uh, something wrapped around the, the, the guy's leg and pulling him into a craft. And then, of course, they arrested the colonel for murder because <laughs> wow. they couldn't find a body, and uh, they kind of didn't believe the story, but two days later... Sergeant Levitt shows up about a quarter of a mile from where he was taken, and he's in pretty much the same condition as the other fellows. Gee, now. And, uh, and another thing, we have no report of any female uh, being done in like this. Really? And what is that with cows? Are you familiar with how that works, if it cows or bulls? Mostly female. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that I saw... I think I may have read two cases where a bull was involved. Hmm. And uh, other than the, uh, like with the cow, the udders were taken. Uh, uh, in the case of the bull, the uh, penis and testicles were removed. Mm-hmm. But now that's another story. When you see some of these pictures where somebody has actually removed the udders without damaging the stomachs of that cow, that's pretty much impossible. There's only like a, a quarter of an inch of skin between the, uh, the outside of the udder skin and the inside, uh, which the next thing they would hit would be the would be the, uh, the one of the one of the cow's stomachs. I mean, mm-hmm. we we talked to some vets and they said, "Hey, there's no way you're going to remove the udders or the whole sack of udders without damaging the stomachs." He said, "Nobody's that precise." I mean, you're using a scalpel. Well, these cuts aren't being made with a scalpel. These these things are cut clean. They're, they don't even show, show signs of being cauterized. I mean, when you cauterize something, there's always a burn mark. I mean, even if they were cauterizing something on your finger, you would see the cut, and then you would see the closure, and you would see a little dark spot around it. Well, that's from the heat. Well, these things show no heat. So what are they using? We don't have anything like that. And is it the same for the people, the precision cutting like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Totally amazing. So anyone, before we move on, if anyone wants to give us a ring and talk to our guest tonight, that's 603-967-4030. You're welcome to call in. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and in these uh, these cases, are they, is there anything that can tie any of them together, any similarities uh, between, say, the victims or... Um, Anything that at all that makes any type of sense where there's some type of connection? The only besides the condition of the body or the carcass, the only thing that kind of ties them all together is that they're in very remote areas when it happens. Hmm. The sergeant, he, you know, he's in the desert. Uh, the the, the uh, guy in Brazil, he's on an island in the middle of a man-made uh, waterway. Some cattle have been found up on high ranges in high mountain areas where, you know, people don't even go up to check on the cattle. I mean, they just turn them loose for the feeding season or whatever, and then they'll round them up come spring or whatever. And uh, these these guys are, you know, they're out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, there have been uh, ranchers that have been had cattle mutilated six or seven times on the same ranch. 
Wow. Uh, one guy had a cow mutilated uh, 50 feet from the barn door. Now, he never saw or heard anything. Just went out that morning and there laid the cow. Right. You've, I've heard of some similar things to that, like on the Skinwalker Ranch and stuff. Now, when we were, um, when I first asked you that question, what I meant was not the cows. Was there anything that can connect the people together? And before no. you answer that, that oh. calls on again. I think I'm going to dare try this. So, hello, caller. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yep okay, go ahead. Say your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, John Tackett, Columbus, Ohio. Hi, John. How are you? Ken, how are you doing tonight, Martin? I'm doing good. What's your uh, question for the guest tonight? My question is, um, what actual specific um, visual is the most common visual UFO you actually see? Um, Because you made a comment earlier that discs are not really as happening as they were. So what would your perspective be on the most common visual sighting of a UFO? What's the shape? The most common visual is I'm going to split between two because they're almost one for one is the triangle and the orb. Okay. Okay, So the orb, now what do you think the orb is? Do you think that's necessarily like a, would would be our like a example of like of our, you know, robotic planes we have at this point? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I I, I know what you're talking about, but these orbs have been seen, they first came into visual range and photographic range during World War II. I know that. Yep, they yeah, they the called them Foo Fighters. Yep. yep. And uh, then they kind of disappeared after the war, and nothing was really seen of them again until the late 50s. And they were very sporadic. There wasn't many of them seen. Um, I think somebody did research one time where they came up with about 100 reports in five years of an orb. Now, <laughs> I, I'll get eight to ten reports a month of an orb. Okay. And how many? And do- then now. Here's some of the theories. Some people think that they are scout ships. Some people think that they are uh, taking samples because there are a lot of reports where an orb is seen. It may, it may be a large orb. Smaller orbs will exit the larger orb, and they will, those smaller orbs will drop to the ground. They will disappear, won't right. be seen again, and then maybe 10, 15 minutes later, they'll come out of wherever they were and go straight up. You know, I was, and, my perspective on, on those orbs mm-hmm. was as drones as we know them in our society. Does that make sense? Well, uh, yeah, and it could be. I mean, it could be, but uh, I, I guess the, the part that always quizzes me about these orbs is that there was a case in Oregon not too long ago. I believe it was uh, last year or the year before. And a matter of fact, it was a MUFON case. And... Um, right. Uh, the gentleman is out cutting his lawn. Uh, he can't work anymore. He has epilepsy pretty bad. So he's out cutting his lawn. He lives on a one-way street that has a turnaround at the end. Uh, at the end of his street, there's a, a opposite the turnaround. It's a T, T intersection. On the other side of the T intersection is a fence and a field and a clump of trees for a farm. He sees an object go behind the farm, which he describes saucer-shaped. It goes behind the trees. He can't see it anymore. Next thing you know, he says the uh, uh, a ship, a craft, it goes back up and disappears into the sky very fast. Out from behind the trees comes an orb that's about the size of a, of a large beach ball, comes down the field, crosses over top of the fence, comes up the street, goes right past him to the point where he can touch it. The dogs in the neighborhood, which are normally quiet, and one German shepherd that's never even barked a day in his life probably, he says, is trying to rip apart to get out of the house. His dog is going bananas. The thing passes him as he looks at it. He said it's actually like um, uh, translucent, but inside it's uh, I had got a buddy many... mine see one. I had a buddy of mine see one, and it looked yeah. kind of like a translucent balloon from a distance. Yep. You could almost yep. see through it. It was also similar to a mirror. Yeah. Yep, that's how he described it. He said it was almost like looking in a mirror with something moving around inside, like different colors. Now, the thing yep. stops on top of a sewer plate, and wow. all kind of start flying off the sewer plate, and then it picks itself up in the, about four or five foot off the ground, goes across the street and attaches itself to a, a pole that's an electric pole, a pole that generates electric, uh, brings the electric into those homes. There's only a few homes on the street. It detaches itself. It starts to go down wait the street. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. 
Now, when it yeah. attached itself to the actual pole, did anybody in the area report any kind of power issues? Yes. They had, there was a drop in power, but nothing went off. I mean, in other, in other words, a light dimmed, like, you know, you were going to lose power. Right. Everything dropped down. By this time, there's neighbors outside. They see it. There's one lady who's on her porch next door to him, screaming at him to get away, and he's just dumbfounded. He's just standing there looking at it. And it, it comes back off the pole, goes back over to the plate, raises up four or five foot in the ground, and just <laughs> vaporizes. Gone. Interesting. So it's almost like a idealistic Mul- transdimensional thing. Man, mass, uh, that, so uh, all total, there were uh, four witnesses that saw the same thing. Interesting. Well, John, hey, he went in the house. He was sick for four days, vomiting. Really? Wow. Mm. Wow. John, John, thanks for calling in. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Hey, you're awesome. Thanks. All right. Bye. Hey, thanks. Yep. Yeah, bye bye. Um. Wow, that's quite the sighting. Hey, you know, we had a, uh, and it's fine that, that we're back on UFOs, but someone wanted to ask you a question in regards to uh, what the conversation was a minute ago. And of the human mutilations, do the common phenomena of black hel- helicopters, uh, lights in the sky? That, well, there have been two reports where uh, black helicopters were seen in the area, not overhead, but in the area. And when I say in the area, within a mile of where the mutilation was found. Yeah, wow. And that was both cattle and human. Now, when, I, when we were talking earlier and I asked what the connections were, uh, it sounded like you started speaking about the cattle mutilations. And mm-hmm. when you said they were you know, left way out remotely and stuff like that, I was asking about the human mutilations. Were there any, is there anything that connect, could connect one to another or any similarities that you're aware of? Other than the wounds, no. That's it. Wow. Yep. Amazing. Now, are there people that are uh, research? Are you one of the few people researching this, or are other people involved? I pretty much think I'm the only one that does it anymore. Uh huh. And um, you said this started back in 1956. That's when this. Yeah, that's when cases started popping up. That. Uh, bodies were being found with strange markings and missing parts. Yeah. And 11 known in the U.S. And you started to say you were unsure about other countries. Do you know? I mean, England, I believe you said. Are there other? Yeah, England. Mm-hmm. England, a uh, researcher over there, Richard Hall, has been investigating these for huh, probably a lot longer than I have. And, uh, you know, he, he's gotten some really great stuff going on over there. I, I, I'm familiar with with most of his stuff, but, you know, he's got a lot of stuff he's holding back yet that he's got to verify. And that's the biggest thing with these cases. you got to verify them before you go talking about them because, you know, they're, they're so strange. They're almost You almost think that somebody just sat there and made them up. But, uh, you know, the cases that have come forward that, you know, like the autopsy reports we can read, you know, I had to, well, I had to get the one from Brazil, uh, translated from uh their you know um their language to the US but it it was worth the 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, excuse me. And not many people speak Portuguese around my area. Uh, yeah. So the I'm, is there anything like a radiation or anything like that any ex, any exposure or any other nope. unusual things? No radiation exposure, no burns, no uh no um how should I say, uh, um, damage done to the body, you know, like with an axe or a, a sharp knife or anything like that. Everything is precision. Uh, they're all done the same way, done in the same way. Same parts are taken, not much body found, and, you know, it's just, it's just very strange. And uh, approximately um, how long is the body, uh, like, left wherever it is? And are, are these indoor, outdoor, wh- where are they found? Most outdoor. Uh, the the only one I know that was indoor was the uh, Cairo case. Hmm. Uh, the other ones were all outdoors. Bliss, Idaho, that was out in the middle of nowhere, um, which is, is strange because and when I first read that report, it kind of took me to Todd Cease because when Cease was found, the area where he lives, and we've been there, I mean, it's so rocky that, you know, I was wearing pretty heavy heavy boots, and those rocks were hurting my feet. I mean, it's just unbelievable how rocky that area is he was found in his socks and his feet were not damaged at all there was no his 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 
feet, ankles, top, bottom were unremarkable. There was no damage, no scratches, no bruises, no nothing. Hmm. How did he get there? <laughs> that is really weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there was, seemed to me that there was another, um, and maybe I'm confusing another case, but okay. that people saw like someone the same thing, like lifted up into a craft, but the guy was really in rough shape when he was found. Is that, is that anything that's that the, sounds familiar to you? That's the same case. It is the same case. Yeah, that's Tatsy's case. Yeah, wow. See, uh, everybody's conception of this is that a UFO picked him up, took him up, and then, you know, a day later dropped him off in the back, uh, you know, out in the back country. But, you know, although we have a report that the guys, the fishermen and the farmer, see something uh, like a man being pulled up into a craft above the power lines uh, dressed in his underwear, which if at a distance from where the river is to where he was seen, and, you know, it's like come out of his driveway and you cross the road, you're at the river. Uh, you have... Um, uh, at that distance, you know, a guy in his shorts and a T-shirt with socks on would look like a guy in his underwear, I guess. And that's how he was found. Cut off jeans, T-shirt, and socks. That was it. Yeah. Wow. Now, you mentioned in the very beginning of the the podcast that, uh, or the live show, that is, um, that you um, had 10 uh, separate chapters or whatever of um, of this organization and some in Europe, are you, like, in touch with these people constantly, or does everyone work on their own? No, we're, we're in contact, uh, contact with everybody. Uh, they know what I'm doing. I know what they're doing. Uh, matter of fact, that case that you uh, were talking about with Alejandro, the, uh, the ham operator and um, uh, the airline pilot, uh, that, that was a MUFON uh, Utah case. Right, and the girl that investigated that, uh, Erica Lukes, is uh, the person that runs my uh, U4 cop uh, branch in Utah. Oh, so you mean familiar. as of just recently? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I like Erica. She's very nice. She's uh, she's a past guest on the show. Yeah, she's she's quite a lady. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she she joined us about uh, I believe it's three weeks now. That's just about right. Um, uh, yeah, we have been playing phone tag because I wanted to find out uh, what exactly transpired. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure she'll share some of that with me. But um, yes, uh, wow. Well, you know, we're getting near the end of the show. And so we have uh, maybe five or five minutes or so left, four or five minutes. And sure. um, do you actually have a website? Yes. Oh, and yeah, it's four cop. Uh, U4COP.com. It's uh, U-F-O-R-C-O-P.com. No, I mean, do you have a personal website, or is that can you just be found on that one? Uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm also on Facebook. We have, like, three pages on Facebook. We have a U4COP page. We have a UFO Research Center of Pennsylvania page. We have a JAR uh, page. I am the editor of JAR Magazine, which is a journal of abnormal abduction research. Huh. Um, and uh, then I have a personal page also. Now, are you um, are you a, re- a retired and you just do all this now? Like this sounds like a full time job. It is a full time job. I'll, when I'm done with you, I'll be up here in my office till about four a.m. Oh, I'll geez. grab six hours of sleep and I'll be back at it. Wow! <laughs> and yeah, I retired in two thousand and thirteen. Yeah. Uh huh. And then basically, this is taking your time. Now, we're, we're one more uh, question along these lines. What's the furthest away that the, the farthest that you will travel for a case? Does it depend on what the case is? Not, not really. I mean, if somebody needs our, like I said before, if anybody needs our help, whether it's something I can do here in the office or through the other groups, or if they require, you know, the, if they need that mobile unit on a site of what they think they have, or, or whether it's a cattle mutilation, whatever, or whatever, whatever comes up, uh, if it's within Pennsylvania, no problem. Uh, I can be at either end of Pennsylvania within five hours or less, way less. And if it's like, say, uh, I'm going out to Missouri to investigate something, uh, as long as they can help with the gas and tolls, I'm on my way. I see. Now, do you have pictures of this rig? Uh, the, uh, we, we just took the old ones down. The new pictures of the new, we just bought a 2016 Ford Transit. And, nice. Uh, 
and uh, it's something we always want. Because the other one was a, a Ford. Uh, it was a 2000. 12, but it was a little low top. This one we can walk around in inside. We have a lot more shelving in it. We just got it back from those folks yesterday. And for the last three days now, I've been shuffling equipment in and out and in and out. We'll have everything ready to roll uh, in the next, uh, by the end of this week, everything will be finished. The only thing that's not won't be finished for two weeks is the, uh, the radio people have to put all the radios back in because uh, we're going to do a different setup this time. We're going to put radios in a console between the seats, just like a police car. Instead yep. of hanging them off the ceiling and all that stuff. Yeah, almost and, like storm chasers in a way. <laughs> oh, we make them look sick. We got more equipment than they do. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I've uh, really enjoyed speaking you, to you tonight. And my pleasure. Yes. And so anyone out there that would like to um, contact you for a UFO report, is it, instead of going to the other two that you hear so much about, they're welcome to contact you? Yeah, they can contact me about anything, whether it's a question they want answered or if there's something I can find in my database or they may have a photograph they want us to look at. Uh, we use uh, Photoshop CMS7 to go over our photographs and a couple other programs we have. Uh, or they uh, they have a case that they want looked at. Um, uh, the only thing I won't do is I won't interfere if somebody else is investigating the case. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I just... I just don't do that. I mean, you know, that's just bad. That's just bad juju. Yeah, but, I uh, totally get that. And, All right. Uh, well, it's it. time to go, and I want to thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope to talk to you soon. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. All right. You take care. You too. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and it's been a great show, I think, and hope you enjoyed it. And if you're listening this far, you're either listening live or you're listening on the dark matter digital network or you're a supporter of the show and listening to the podcast remember you can still uh donate doesn't matter what it is uh for the buzz off for cancer for kids that i did and yes i'm bald as a cucumber you can check that out on podcast ufo thanks for listening we have the one and only stanton t friedman is on next week and we'll be back then same time same place Remember to keep your eyes to the sky and your curiosity high.